everyone, and welcome to the Family Tree House, a podcast series brought to you by Storied, where I chat with people that have a passion for genealogy, storytelling, or both. I am your host, Heather Honert, and today I am super excited to get a chat with our guest, Melanie McComb, genealogist and international lecturer. That's so exciting to say that. <laughs> with American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogy Society. Hello, Melanie's Heather. Hey, how are you today? Good. How are you? I'm great. I am like, I look at your list of like areas of expertise and, and you are amazing. So Melanie is like <laughs> Irish genealogy, DNA, Atlantic Canada, Jewish genealogy, military records. You just run the gamut. <laughs> <laughs> I keep busy. Yeah. <laughs> but out of all of those things, like what is your, what is your favorite? I would say I'm doing a lot more with DNA lately. Um, okay. I work very closely with a lot of patrons, helping people discover either more recent history, like finding out who their parents, grandparents were, great grandparents, and even just going back and trying to uh, verify their family tree using DNA. Yeah, you know, we were we were just having a, a conversation the other day um, in one of the meetings I was in at Storied, and and we were talking about that how you know the you, know, you kind of have the older generation of genealogy people like me. Um, and then you've got, you know, the young ones. And we felt like, you know, the young ones, when you say genealogy and family history, it's like DNA is what they grab onto. It's kind of what they know and, and what they think of um, when they think of genealogy. So um, yeah, I, it is, I have not delved into that myself personally. I mean, I've done the DNA, but I haven't really done any research with it. So um excited. Just another little area to to jump into at some point. Absolutely. And it's definitely a game changer in the yeah. industry. So yeah, and, and can prove, you know, that's the difference, can unequivocally prove things. Um, so Melanie, why don't you start by by telling everybody a little bit about your background, kind of how you got started in in family history, um yeah, as a as a profession and and even just um personally. Sure. Um, so I am originally from Long Island, New York, and I started genealogy when I went to college. I went to the University of New York at Oswego in, New um, in upstate New York, or I guess central New York, I'd say. And I actually was pursuing a degree in zoology. Um, and one of the uh, lessons I had to do in one of my genetics classes was to do a medical family tree. Mm -hmm. And I had dabbled in family history a little before that, you know, going through the photographs of, of my family and asking, you know, who's that? Who's that? When was that? You know, and getting into like when I was doing scrapbooking. But I was really, when I was starting to do that was when, with the medical tree, um, that was when we first started to uh, be encouraged to do family interviews. So I had to interview family members with very personal medical questions, which was interesting. Um, but it, it got me started in looking more into it. I That was when I really was first introduced to sites like Ancestry.com and started to um, delve into like the census and just see what other things I could find, um, you know, starting with, with even just my father's family, which is Irish. Um, and my, my mother's side is Jewish. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was just really along the way, I felt like I was just getting deeper and deeper. And, you know, I started, you know, adding on subscriptions after, you know, I finished college, because, um, you know, genealogy is an expensive hobby. And uh, that's when I really it's just, you know, it just, it just I, the, the bug just kind of bit me and I've been doing it for close to 20 years now. So, and I, after college, I went on to work in the human resources industry. I was doing a lot of uh, technology software. Um, so, which, so you can get an idea of like, my mind is uh, kind of going, going from like a scientific technical background, which actually worked really well with, with transition to genealogy. Yeah. And I was just uh, kind of tired of the, uh, the rat race, so to speak of corporate, you know, and after doing mm -hmm. that for so long, um, and, the opportunity came up after going to Roots Tech, actually, which is an international oh. genealogy conference. So I was just, yeah. I just decided like, you know what, this is what I want to do professionally. I want to make a change. And so my husband and I actually moved out to, uh, to Boston and I got involved with uh, actually doing like sub work on Saturdays in the library mm -hmm. um, at American Ancestors. And 
then a position opened up and I applied for it and I got it. And I guess the rest is history. I've been there about five years now. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely been a long journey. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been interesting. I know my, not a lot of people would think that someone with a zoology degree and going into business would have, uh, you know, transitioned to <laughs> genealogy, but I think it's given me a really good skill set that I can apply to things. So it makes it actually, I think a little easier in some ways, um, cause you're applying the scientific method, you're, you're applying project management skills, and those are all good things that you can use in doing your family history. Absolutely. I, I spoke with um, Sophie Kay. She's a doctor in the UK a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yes. Okay. She is, same thing, you know, having that that scientific background has has just a game changer and a different way of looking at things. So that's awesome. And I love that you just, it's, you know, you have that career and then you go to Roots Tech and, and bam, you get to do something and, and hopefully it's just, it, it seems like it's a passion and just exudes free, you know, happiness for you. So that's awesome that you get to do that. Absolutely. So Melanie, tell us why you think storytelling is such an important part of family history. Storytelling is a really good way to connect people to family history, because especially if you're, if you're talking with others that are not dealing with documents and staying up until 3 a.m. on all the websites and, mm -hmm. you know, and going to archives. I think storytelling is a way to get people interested in particular family and also just to pass on what's been known. You know, while we like to say that, you know, we want to be careful with family lore because there's, you know, there's, there's there can be a lot of mistruths in there. I always do say there is a nugget of truth in there. So <laughs> by passing down this oral history, it's a way of keeping our our history alive. And it's a, it's a way to pass that on, you know, from generation to generation. So, you know, God forbid if things are ever lost, like in a fire or something else happens, like your computer crashes, by telling people the stories, in a way, people won't be forgotten. Right. Um, how do you go about, if you are going to write a story, um, how, how do you go about doing that? Do you have a process or? Yeah, so I, I generally am a very big proponent of like micro um, like microblogging and like even just doing like first starting off with just like, you know, smaller, like, you know, kind of like when doing tweets on Twitter and things on Facebook and just starting to get like little tidbits of information. And then I usually like to then evolve into a blog post. Mm -hmm. So I have a blog personally, uh, the Shamrock Genealogist, which I need to update more <laughs> and, uh, and our work one Vita Brevis. So at American Ancestors. So I find that by starting with a smaller amount of information and then building it out as you go could be a good way. And it's really finding, I guess, a theme or um, you know what you think is probably gonna be the main core of what you wanna tell a story about and then building your research and the narrative around it to make it a fuller story. Yeah, I, I, love, I love the bite-sized chunks to start with. And that I think that's what, you know, most people will read the bite-sized chunks, but, you know, a lot of people get overwhelmed and think I'm going to have to write a biography that's, you know, all of these pages. And it's really those smaller bits that people um, kind of latch onto and, and will read. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And and we always get to tell even our patrons, like, don't wait to write the big book. I always said I was going to write the big book of genealogy in my family, and it's just not happening. So, but by doing a little bit at a time, it's getting out there and eventually all of those, you know, smaller posts could make up that book eventually to be right. passed on, but don't wait, you know, start now, write something, get it out there. Yep. Yep. Great advice. Um, tell us what, do you have any, do you recommend any resources or tools for those people that are just kind of getting started in, um, in researching and starting their family history? Yes. So on AmericanAncestors.org on our site, we actually have a number of free downloads that you can use that are really helpful with getting started and also with doing writing your family history. Some of these include interview questions where you could interview your family, your friends, neighbors, um, you, you have different templates of information. You can put the information in, including different research logs and research plans. And we even help you with, you know, learning how to write as well. We have, you know, books that we sell in our bookstore, for example, also on uh, 
genealogical writing and including different templates and checklists and things you can try to uh, make sure you're accounting for a lot of things. So we're very big on making newer tools. Um, in a lot of the different programs we've been doing, we usually like to come up with different ways, like how can we record like this type of records, like land deeds or um, house history. We have some things on house history you can do. A lot of people are interested in reviewing like, well, who actually lived in my home at some point before me. Uh, I love the website and I, my plug is I'm a member because it has such great resources on it. And I will make sure um, at the, on the, our podcast information page to make sure and link to those um, kind of the free resources. So people can, can check those out. Um, how do you use, this is one of my favorite things. So I'm, I'm curious to get your take on this. How do you use historical records in particular to help tell your stories? I find historical records are really good ways to illustrate the facts in there. It's not so much about writing the narrative of like, so-and-so lived in this place and this census. Like sometimes it helps just to show the actual document that shows the whole family living together. I like to show things like church records or, um, or you know, things from like different archives, for example. Um, I recently, actually a few months ago, I, had, I went to the Boston City Archives, for example, when I was working on a blog post, and I was looking into the uh, temporary home for women and children, which was housing a lot of, uh, a lot of the poorer population at yeah. the time. And there was just so many good bite-sized stories in there right in the document like there was just like mini bios right in there I mean this is like a perfect way to illustrate um, something about someone is looking at those documents that give those mini sketches to help illustrate a little bit more and just to show what what's what uh, someone's conditions were at that time yeah I think that people get so hung up on um the, the facts and the numbers, you know, the name of the person and a birth date and a death date. And so many of these records have, like you said, just those many bite-sized extra nuggets of goodness um, that people can add to their stories. So I, I love historical records for that, for that aspect. Um, Melanie, this is my favorite part. I always <laughs> love asking everybody, like you share, what is a, a the story that just resonates with you? And, and a lot of people say, well, Heather, mine changes. You know, it's not always the same story, but like right now in time, um, <laughs> what is your, what is your favorite um, kind of family story? I would say it's, it's mostly around my great grandfather. He actually has two stories. Well, I'll, I'll at least share one of them. If you have time, I'll share the other as well. Um, and I had found when I was researching my distant uh, Corcoran cousins that came from County Louth, Ireland. Uh, they came from a town called Dillonstown. So if it's a Corcoran and Dillonstown, it's my family. Yeah. Um, and a <laughs> small plug. Um, and I, I came across one particular person named Bernard, or as he was known as Barney Corcoran. And I, I had saw that when I found his passport application, I found a very uh, you know interesting tidbit. It had shared that he was actually blind. And I saw that he was going to, it looks like he might've been going back to Ireland. Um, and that wasn't even the best part. I also happened to notice that on the previous page was actually my great grandfather's photograph from his passport application. So That's they applied. Amazing. So they applied at about the same time. So there's got to be something there. Yeah. So I, of course, had to dig into my great grandfather's application. And I saw that he was actually accompanying his cousin Bernard to Ireland, who was a former soldier. Okay. Wow. So, and, and, and they actually are like second cousins to give you an idea yeah. too, but they both yeah. come from the same town. Uh, and, and we, and so I had to dig in more and to find <laughs> out, well, how did Bernard get blinded? And, and it was a tidbit about him being a soldier. I'm like, okay, so looking at the time period, uh, we're looking at, okay, it's probably going to be, you know, World War One based on the mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. And I started digging more and more into his service. And I had found things like uh, military uh, service abstracts on him. He was in yeah. the New York National Guard. 
And they had actually mentioned wh- where he got blinded. <gasps> so he was That's actually amazing. blinded in battle. Uh, he actually had a, a bullet graze mm-hmm. one of his eyes and it passed through the other as well. So he was actually blind in both eyes as a oh result my gosh. of that. And I believe it was at the Battle of Thiers in France that this happened, though. And it was, it was I was told that it was a very bloody battle. And so I started digging more into like the actual history of what he was doing um, and and, you know, what what it was like. But his story didn't end there. So so, yes, his uh, second cousin took him back to Ireland to visit with his parents because he had already moved to the United States where he had joined in the U.S. military. So he was part of our service when he got injured. And but that's not where the story ends. He didn't let that injury define his life. He mm-hmm. actually was was in a military rehabilitative hospital and he had actually so he learned to read Braille. Wow. Um, and in the process, he had also done so many great things, including um, he had actually created a Braille version of the Bible that he had actually given to um, several religious individuals, including in Ireland as well. He also was active with the, there was there was actually a, like a band, a, like a, mu- a musical group that he was involved with and helping other disabled veterans um, hmm. be able to put on charity concerts and things like that. So that, it just, yeah. That, that t- amazing to me that you can, you know, going down that rabbit hole, I always say that of, you know, you find one tidbit of information on that passport application and look at the incredible story that you have from that. Melanie, how old was he when he was in service? He was in service. Let's see. He was, okay. He, he went into the military at 26 years old. Okay. Yeah, and and he was he was injured. I think a few years after that, though. Yeah, so, so so late twenties, you know. Yeah, so very young. Yep, and he was actually in the 69th, uh, which is the Fighting Irish uh, New York Infantry. Wow. So a lot of a lot of Irish men uh, were part of that unit uh, as part of that, and um, and it even got even a little bit better because besides like him going to you know the different schools, I think it was the Evergreen School that he met. He actually met his first wife there. Um, it was told uh-huh. that I think she might have been a nurse or visiting there, and that's how he met her. Yeah. That's so it, fe- it feels like a weird serendipity, like horrible <laughs> what happened to him. But, you know, he met, you know, he fed, he met his first love there. So, yeah. and, you know, and they had uh, t- uh, two children and then uh, she died. A little, she died a little, a little later. I think they divorced and then he met someone else. Um, but, you know, he he really went on to, you know, have a good life um, based on what he did. And I think there was one quotation that was really poignant where he said that he hasn't seen Ireland since, um, you know, since before he got got injured, though. But he, he seemed yeah. like he had a lot of like grace about it, though, that yes. you know, he was still able to go back and see his and go to his, you know, visit his parents and his siblings and cousins and still have that connection uh, back, but still feel proud of his service as an American as well. Yeah, just and the incredible things that he accomplished, even you know, with his disability, is that's incredible. Great, that's a great story. I had goosebumps when you were telling me. Um, we, I would love. We have time, so if you have time and you would be willing to share your other story, we, I would love to hear it. Sure. So now I'll tell you a story actually about my great grandfather, same one actually, the one that was accompanying him on there, okay. Thomas Thomas yeah. James Corcoran. So. Um, a few. Uh, so when I first started testing my DNA, um, and I tested on Ancestry a couple of years after I started 23andMe, I received a very um, almost cryptic message at times where um, a woman in England had said that she said, I am happy that my grandfather found happiness in America. And she mentioned the name Thomas, but I didn't. It didn't hit me that it was my great grandfather. I thought maybe she was thinking about maybe his son or another relative that was called Thomas, because Thomas is not a very unique name. So yeah. what didn't really put the clues together. Fast forward a few years later, I got my dad to take a DNA test. I got my dad's first cousin to take a test, and I got my dad's sister to take a test as well. My aunt and my aunt and my uh, dad's first cousin um, had said that they had heard from her too. And I was like, 
Hmm, interesting. Okay. And the connection seemed a lot closer than I thought it was. Yeah. And they were starting to ask me all these questions and they were trying to be like, and then my dad's first cousin even asked me like, was this Thomas Corcoran, your great grandfather? Was this the one she was talking about? And I remember I started going back to my message with that, uh, with that, with that person that had messaged me and I got more details and I was like, can you tell me a little bit more? I'm really intrigued. I want to know more. Yeah. And it turned out that my great grandfather, before he came to America from Ireland, he had actually had a relationship with a, the servant girl in their household mm -hmm. and they had a child together. And so this person was related and, to them. Yep, absolutely. Yep. So the person, so, so th that was, he was a son. And interestingly enough, the son was actually named after his father. He was given his full father's name. Wow. Which was really interesting because my great grandfather named a later son That's after cool. him as well. Yeah. So it was very much a hidden secret no one knew about. Um, so yes, the woman that had messaged me, that was, the son was her, uh, so, so, so my great grandfather was, was her, um, was, was, was her grandfather. So they had yeah. not known about this connection. So she was actually related um, through uh, the connection with the son. So because of this, so it was really interesting that, you know, that that was, you know, if that was her father and, you know, finding out about this connection about why the grandfather was, was left, um, you know, it started really to be a really interesting story. So I had actually, um, we had exchanged messages with this person back and forth and uh, she had exchanged contact information with my aunt and uh, she talked to her for quite a bit actually too. So it was, they actually started a relationship as half first cousins. Um, to be able to share that. And my, my aunt said something, something that was really poignant. I thought she said that it humanized my grandfather to see that, you know, as, as much as we like to think that there's not going to be any exciting stories and oh, there, you know, there, everyone was good Catholics and nothing, nothing happened. Like you always can find surprises and especially in the DNA and the DNA was really the way we found um, the story. It was the only way we would have known about this. Um, so, you know, his, his wife never, you know, his, my great, -gra my great grandmother never knew about this. Uh, my, uh, you know, my father never knew about this. So it was definitely something that only just came to light, but it added an interesting, you know, bit of it. And the story goes is that his parents, Thomas's parents were, were very upset with this happening. And it sounded like he wanted to get back and he wanted to get, he wanted to get together and marry um, the woman of his child. And he was sent to, he was, and he was supposedly sent to America a couple of years later to be sent out. So he never returned. I mean, a lot of his siblings stayed behind in Ireland, but he was quote sent away to, to leave um, when the child was about maybe three years old or so. So, it, it, you know, and that, that's going to be kind of a hard thing to verify though, but it makes for an interesting story that, you know, you know, had he had married this, this woman, you know, yeah. my whole line wouldn't exist. Right. Right. You know? <laughs> and, and that's the thing that gives me goosebumps. Cause it's like thinking about, yeah. you yeah. know, those are the kind of things that can happen in a timeline that really can change everything. And sure. I know, and I'm always helping people like, how do you deal with someone? They're suddenly gone, you know, and what yeah. happens. So, you know, I, I, I just found it a really fascinating uh, way of, you know, uncovering um you know some of these dna mysteries that come up yes yeah do you did you have a picture of him before you found it on the passport application i don't think i did offhand i know that my aunt had actually sent me some pictures of him um later on in life though but that was the first one when he was a much younger man yes yeah, so yeah. so yes I, I did get a few of them later on yeah. um that that, that that i was able to see so i i think that's always as soon as you said that it made me think of how important it is to to turn that page you know i think so oh yes well look at that one page and don't i always look at the you know, one before and one after because you never know what you'll find Oh, yeah. And, and uh, yeah, that's why I love the passport applications. Nobody thinks that they're going to have one. But I mean, there are so many cases where people are applying for them and they are just a gold mine. Um, we, I actually yeah. was assisting my my colleague, uh, David Allen Lambert, with a consultation. And uh, our, one of our patrons was looking for a naturalization record for one of his ancestors. It was either his father or his gra uh, father or grandfather. And we had actually found the passport application because we knew the naturalization was going to take a little while in upstate New York to find. 
And there it was. There was his picture on the second page. It told where in Italy he was from. And it was just a goldmine of information. Yeah. And it was just an, a, a record that really could bring tears to someone's eyes just to see yeah. that information. What are a few tips, um, tricks, pieces of advice or wisdom you have that you would like to leave with our audience about? It can be, you know, genealogy in general or storytelling, whatever you want. The biggest thing I would say, whether it's reviewing documents or photographs, is dissect it in detail. Look for different things that could jump out at you. So whether it's a medical condition, military service, um, someone's, you know, uh, financial circumstances changing radically, whether poor or richer, um, you know, migration patterns where some, someone's suddenly going somewhere, interesting occupations, um, thinking about just different themes that could really spark um, a, a story in there, uh, something that's unexpected. Yeah. And then once you do it. I think that's kind of like, kind of like what I was doing before was get, you know, kind of hone in on that and try to like, ask yourself, what questions do I want to know about this particular event? And then go out and start to do the research and find out what happened. Yeah. And then once you've gathered the research, put together a timeline and then start to create your narrative. Uh, you have just been a wealth of information for our, our watchers and listeners today. So I am, I feel blessed that I got a chance to talk to you. So oh, thank, thank you, you so for, much. It was so nice yeah, to talk to you. Thank you for spending time with us today. It has, it has been a treasure for me. Thank you. Until next time, friends, embrace the power of your family's untold tales and embark on a journey of discovery. Let the ink flow and the words dance as you weave together the threads of your ancestors' lives. Start writing your family stories today and let their voices echo through the generations to come at story.com. And that brings us to the end of this episode of The Family Treehouse, where we celebrate the power of storytelling and preserving our family legacies. Story is more than just a platform for sharing stories. Dive into those historical records and newspapers, discovering the hidden gems that bring your ancestors to life. Add branches to your family tree, connecting the dots between generations. Thank you for joining us on this storytelling journey. Your stories matter, and through story, they have the power to resonate across time and touch the hearts of generations to come. Keep uncovering your family's history and keep the spirit of storytelling alive with Storied.